Stan Jabalisco here, proprietor and operator of amateur radio station W1GV, Whiskey One Good Vibrations. I'm going to tell you a little story. I'm sure you just love my stories, right? But this goes way back to my high school and college days when I had a very keen interest in the very low uh, frequencies. Uh, which technically are defined as 10 to 30 kilohertz uh, by some people and 3 to 30 kilohertz by others. I uh, made a little VLF, very low frequency converter, by plugging my 20 meter uh, vertical antenna into the microphone jack of my Drake T4X transmitter, placing the transmitter in spot, turning it on spot meaning just the oscillators uh, and well that the anything past the modulator isn't being used so it doesn't send anything out over the air but it creates a signal so you can locate it in the receiver the drake r4a i set the transmitter for the am amplitude modulation mode and 3500 kilohertz and then i tuned away from that carrier wave using my R4A on the sharpest CW sele uh, selectivity setting that it had. And that, in effect, created a converter which would work all the way down from about 60 or 70 kilohertz down to zero, down to DC. Uh, actually, when the carrier got within a kilohertz or two of the pass band of the receiver, it uh, overwhelmed the receiver. But here's what I noticed. I noticed a bunch of what appeared to sound like today's phase shift keyed signals below uh, 20 kilohertz. I heard WWVL at 20 kilohertz. I heard uh, uh, WWVB at 60 kilohertz and a, a wide variety of teletype sounding like signals all over the place all the way down to 13 or 14 kilohertz where there were uh, several intermittent tones at different intervals it sounded like a very slow version of today's WSJT type modulation modes and in fact may have been just exactly that. And this was in the 1970s. Uh, in fact, I plugged that antenna into the microphone jack of a Panasonic tube type tape recorder, which you could set so that it would just amplify and, and act like a little audio, audio amplifier. And I could actually hear those 13 and 14 kilohertz signals. Uh, as very high-pitched audio tones. So we were getting down into the audio frequency range. But, alas, below about 8 or 9 kilohertz, dirty electricity, all of the artifacts of human-made noise carried by the AC lines in my house, my parents' house, actually, and surrounding neighborhood, overwhelmed all reception, but there wasn't anything down there to be heard anyway. I did make a noise canceling antenna which nulled out that noise to about 30 dB, the extent 20 to 30 dB nulled out the noise and didn't affect the signals. Helped a lot on uh, WWVL and uh, that 20 kilohertz and below in those various signals between 13 and 20 kilohertz. Uh, you may come across videos yet today of people with VLF converters tuning the bands down there and hearing much the same thing as I did back in those days. I even built a little transmitter, a one-tube transmitter at 8 kilohertz and sent signals over a distance of about a block, city block, tenth of a mile, or maybe something on the order of, well, you do the math as for kilometers, but all the point of this is there are uh, treasures down there to be had. If I could go out into the middle of the ocean where there were no human-made noise sources and fly a 
kite-supported antenna where the Federal Aviation Administration wouldn't care if I flew it a mile high. The atmosphere might zap me, but the FAA wouldn't. I wondered what I'd hear. They've told stories, some people who have listened down there and under those circumstances, of the ionosphere swishing and swooshing and making all kinds of cool sounds down around two or three kilohertz. And in fact, you could listen on a little audio preamplifier and actually listen to baseband uh, electromagnetic signals and hear this whooshing and hissing. And when an aurora would take place, you'd hear a lot more whooshing and hissing. I wonder what lies below that. When you start to have to measure frequency in terms of fractions of a hertz, and it actually becomes better mathematically to talk about the period of a wave rather than the frequency. One second equals one hertz. Two seconds equals half a hertz. Ten seconds equals a tenth of a hertz. And then you get up into periods of hours and days and weeks and months and years. Those signals are out there in outer space. They do exist. Some of us not, uh, some of them too low not only for us to detect with modern equipment, but to interpret were we, were, were we able to detect them? The sun has a 22-year sunspot cycle noted by oscillations in its magnetic field. A period of 22 years. I wonder if other stars do the same thing, but at different frequencies. 33 years, 40 years, 11 years, well, half of our sun. 17 years, or maybe some really, really low ones down there, like a hundred years. And I wonder if all combined in the galaxy of some 200 billion stars, all of these stars have their own particular frequency, their own particular note to play in the electromagnetic universe that surrounds us. It's there. I'm not, this is not fantasy. I wonder what it would sound like if somehow we could convert it up and play it in an orchestra, say. The electromagnetic stellar symphony, or the, the stellar electromagnetic symphony, or, or you give it a name. It's there, and I want to hear it. I'll find a way because I'm a radio ham and radio hams find a way to do everything except stop hamming. Maybe someday I'll even send CQ at a period of 10 years. It'd take a long time to send that CQ, wouldn't it? Stan Jabalisco W1 GV W1 goofy vibrations, saying 73, which still means best regards, and da-da-da-da-da-da, regardless of the period, which means, of course, in ordinary English, so long.